Here's, I will tell you something that every single person knows. And the minute I say it, you will know it's true. And even if you hate me, and even if you disagree with me, and even if you're on the left, you will know it's true. Not one of us is the person we are meant to be. Not one of us is the person that we were born and are supposed to be. We all know it. Each and every one of us knows it. You tell the m most famous, most successful movie star, baseball player, whatever it is in history, that uh, read this book, it'll change your life. He'll read this book because he knows he's got to change his life. Every single one of us knows that we are flawed and broken. And so if you start to live into that image, even just turning the ship in the direction of its North Star, turning the ship of your soul in the direction of the North Star, you will start to experience joy. And how do you do that? Well, you Welcome to another edition of Counterculture. What is living the good life? This is a question our guest on this episode has thought and written quite a bit about. Not something you might expect from a person who spent much of his professional life in and around Hollywood. The eschatological left promises we're just a cultural revolution away from heaven on earth. Is that where we're headed? An inexorable march to Xanadu as we rescue the planet from the evil clutches of man and throw off the chains of private property and 1.6 gallons per flush toilet tanks? Or quite ironically, has Marxism become the opiate of the masses? Wilhelm Reich, the Marxist founder of the Frankfurt School of Social Theory in the 1920s, a student of Freud's, who's actually the originator of the phrase sexual revolution. Reich said that revolution would never come to America by force. Red Dawn would never work. The family had to break up itself. The way to do that, Reich said, was by selling everyone on the idea that fornication, adultery, all these things were good things. The sexual revolution would destroy the family, make Christianity retrograde, and thus usher in the family-free, science-based revolution of the autonomous man. Are we there yet, this brave new world? Andrew Clavin is an American writer of crime and suspense novels, including Don't Say a Word and True Crime. He's a conservative commentator. He's also worked in film as an, as an essayist and video satirist. He uh, is the host of the Andrew Clavin Show podcast over at The Daily Wire and has written a number of excellent nonfiction books, Great Good Things, How a Secular Jew Comes to Faith in Jesus Christ, as well as Truth and Beauty, which details the works of Christian-oriented English poets, and he's got a new book coming out that you can pre-order now. It's the latest in the Cameron Winters mystery series called The House of Love and Death. The House of Love and Death is Andrew Clavin's latest work. Andrew Clavin joins us now. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Counterculture. Really appreciate it. Thanks. It's good to see you then. Uh, so uh, was, was, was Wilhelm Reich right? Or are those who, on the left who suggest that... Uh, the latest iterations of the Crusades to save the planet is the path towards the better, brighter future. Where well, are we at? All these, guys, all these guys you mentioned, William Reich, uh, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, uh, they were all absolutely right if there is no God. And unfortunately for them, that's what they were wrong about. That's where they went wrong, and it gave them a wrong idea of what human beings are. Of course, we're sexual beings. Of course, uh, you know, eros flows through us and has powerful effects on us. But we're more than that, and we include uh, a moral sense that guides us and actually is implanted in us and, and has a way of finding its way even beyond logic, even beyond reason, even beyond science, that people just know when things are, are good and bad. And this is what Freud, who was basically trying to help, he wasn't a, a bad person, he was, he was trying to get people to solve certain problems that uh, a repressed society had given them. But he didn't really understand that not all repression comes from society. Some of it comes from the human heart. And so in the wake of Sigmund Freud, this idea that our sexuality is the core of us, which is a foolish mistake, has, has taken over and it has been inculcated into, it has been ingested by Marxism as a political thing because it means you can get women out of the home, where they're the, where, which is the most important job women do and the most important job in society, mothering, nurturing, building homes. That is the key to human thriving and human freedom. Uh, it can get men out of the home. It can get them to be unfaithful and promiscuous and follow their, the instincts of their bodies. And it, it, ultimately makes us slaves. And when we become slaves, we turn to the government for help because we're, we, we're helpless. And so now, you know, they've, they've pushed us very close to this 
um, to this model that people are staring at porn, men are staring at porn until they become impotent. Women are finding that they get married too late. They're finding it difficult to have children. They're finding themselves locked in careers that are not fulfilling, that they were told were going to fulfill them. And, and now we find that people who are, you know, let's let's say deviant sexually who are, whose sexuality is not keyed toward the reproduction reproduction of human life are trying to take our children unto themselves and in, instruct them into how to be like them how to be gay how to be queer how to be transgender all of these things and so as that vision starts to come to fruition i think people are maybe beginning to see that this was a wrong turn but the the nettle that everybody's having a, a hard time grasping is that they're first going to have to let go of the material idea of human beings, the idea that we are meat puppets filled with chemistry sets. Uh, that idea is what all this is based on. And I, it's hard to explain to conservatives, especially libertarians, but if you don't start there, then everything the left says makes sense. It only stops making sense when you understand that we are spiritual beings as well as physical beings. Well, you're talking about the distinction that not enough people make between liberty and libertine. Um, there's there's a difference. And and I think this is what you were getting at. I mean, what you're getting at here, but also in a recent podcast I saw uh, of yours on The Daily Wire, you talk about the the miserable matriarchy. Is that that's what you're describing? Yeah, well, yes. I mean, I, I think I, I think it's really unfair uh, and conservatives do this too much to blame women. But the, the whole point about culture and culture is kind of the drum I've been beating for 20 years trying to explain to conservatives that we need to pay attention to it. But most people. 98% of people, let's say, are born into a culture and live according to that culture's rules. It's it's the odd man out, the, the very smart, very original, creative person who says, wait a minute, maybe this culture is bad. Maybe I was born into Nazi Germany and these guys have got everything wrong. That's not the way most people behave. Most people follow the leader. Most people follow the rules of the game. And so that's what the left has been uh, careful to do is, is change the rules of the game while we were playing around with stupid things like, you know, congressional races in Ohio. And so it, it's not right to blame women for living in a culture that told them you're not going to be satisfied raising children. You're not going to be satisfied building homes. You can't have a, a career that keeps you inside the home and then lets you move out of the home as your children go away. You must follow man, men's rules. You must follow men's values, men's rules. You have to succeed in a career. You have to make money. You have to become famous. You have to make sure that you have power. And now women are miserable. And you keep seeing these articles in the paper that say, Oddly, women are miserable in spite of feminism, despite feminism. And you go, no, because feminism. Right, it's sort of a Fox Butterfield moment. Yeah, right. Right. So it's, and, and it's just wrong to take these poor women who are just living according to the rules as they were taught and say, you know, your life is meaningless, you have no children, you're living an empty, promiscuous, uh, dr drunken life. It's, it's not their fault. That's what they were told to do. That's what they were instructed to do. And it was calculated, it was intended, and it was successful. And if conservatives don't start talking back, it's it's going to continue to be successful. The one thing I want to say, though, that I noticed is hopeful. A, a small number, but a growing number of highly intelligent, highly accomplished women are beginning to say the same thing that I've been saying for a long time, which is feminism is wrong per se. It is the wrong idea that, that the building of home, the nurturing of children is the most honorable female occupation there is. And without it, there is nothing else. Without homes... I'm not just talking about, you know, raising kids. I'm talking about building homes, home homemaking. Uh, homemakers are the most important people in any society. And it is a shame that this society has not only not given them their proper honor and due, but has basically, you know, uh, run them down and minimized them and said, oh, she's just a homemaker. She's just a mom. Yeah, I, you know, um, yeah, I, th it seems to me this is a peer-to-peer -peer project uh, as well. This is not going to be conservative commentators, you know, sort of, um, inflaming the hearts, right? It, it needs to be peer to peer. And I, I thought this piece from Itsu Diaz over at The Spectator was interesting. Uh, one of the things he uh, argues, get your reaction, feminists thought their enemy was the real man when the truth is that any woman's worst enemy is a half man. The cowardly, self-conscious half man, the ally of any old feminist cause, is usually the one who's emboldened by female weakness and takes advantage of others to humiliate them. He's also capable of selling his mother in order to avoid personal conflict. By contrast, the gentleman, the traditional man, has his own code of values 
and he would rather lose a testicle than hurt a lady, be rude to her, or boast about that stupid thing that only radical feminists believe in, which is the supposed male superiority. What do you think? Does he have it? Uh, yes, I, I think it, it, is, it is really true. I mean, anything that is harming women is also harming men and vice versa. And that's exactly the plan. That has been the plan is to break up the family because the family is the bulwark of, of freedom. And unfortunately, a lot of the talk on the right, I feel, is sometimes, uh, I don't know, draped in this kind of icky, uh, controlling notion. You, you talk about the Bible saying that a, a wife should submit to her husband. But then the Bible, the Bible does say that and then goes on to say for like paragraph after paragraph right. that a right. husband should attend to his wife's happiness. And so what he's what they're talking about there is natural love. They're talking about a, a leadership role in the family for a man and a uh, and a, that frees a woman to create a culture in the family that will uh, induce happiness and healthiness in in the children. That's how societies are built. That's how families are built. And most importantly, that's what makes life worth living. You know, all the other stuff you do is, you know, on your deathbed, you're not going to wish you, you went to one more meeting, but you are going to wish that you maybe didn't leave your uh, wife and leave your children fatherless. And so I, I really do think that this, it, it's values, and we have to learn that these values are, are joyful values. These are not oppressive values. The press likes to say, that, but here's how the media deals with this. You come in and you say, a male, female household raising children is the model of human beings. It is the model for happy human beings. And they immediately say, well, what about gay people? And you say, well, hey, you know, there can be gay people. I'm not, I have nothing against gay right. people. I'm right. saying that the model of human beings is a male, female household with raising children together. And the state has an interest in supporting that and pr promoting that. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, the state doesn't have any interest in crushing people who have oddball sexuality. It has, it does have an interest in privileging, supporting, elevating, a homemaking mother and a, a a working dad. That's that's what the state. That's the state's interest. If if the state is interested in, in promoting freedom and uh, you know human thriving, which the state is not. Right. I, I wanted to go back to something you said about Freud, the early sexual revolutionaries, if you will. He said he was essentially he was well intended. Not that that particularly matters, but um, but just thinking about that a little bit in the sense of do they do they know what they were doing? You know why didn't the Frankfurt School, why didn't Marcuse and Reich, why didn't they start with uh, pronouns and puberty blockers? They had to know something. And it's not like uh, depravity is something that's only attendant to the 21st century or, or you know, you needed to read a Gore Vidal novel uh, 50 years ago in order to appreciate what uh, the, 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 the descents to which people could sink. So, so they understood something about, I think, as you were getting to in the beginning, about the appeal you know, what is most appealing? What's the first thing that we need to do in order to get people to start committing self-inflicted wounds to break up the family, that model you just spoke about? And then we progress from there. Maybe we don't exactly know where we go from there. Maybe we don't exactly know what the progression is going to be. But it seemed like they had an insight into what the best way was for the state to insinuate itself into the family uh, after the family had essentially uh, committed cultural suicide. Yeah, I mean, what happens is, you know, somebody, Rene Girard, the French philosopher, said, you know, one of the, uh, I'm misquoting this, I'm paraphrasing it, but he said one of the worst things that can hap happen to a philosopher is to be taken seriously. And I think that that's <laughs> one of the things that happened to Freud. You know, Freud was a normal Victorian, he wasn't normal, but he was a Victorian guy who believed that, uh, you know, marriage was a good thing and a male-female relationship was a good thing and that that's what he was trying to cure people in order for them to have. Uh, but he had no sense that we were anything but meat. He had he was didn't believe in God. He believed that God was an illusion. He wrote an entire book about it called The Future of an Illusion, you know, and how God was going to dis slowly disappear because he wasn't real. And everything was scientific and physical. When people started to take that seriously, they started to think, well, why should I be repressed at all? Which was not what Freud was saying. But again, he was taken seriously. He, you know, what he was saying is repression can be a beautiful thing, but it also comes along with frustrations. But what he never said was the never said was the built in inborn God given human conscience will tell you when repression is right and when repression is wrong. Of course, people can be over repressed. Of course, they can feel guilty about normal human sexuality. Of course, they can be twisted and all that. But what happened to Freud is those other fellows you mentioned, like Marcuse, especially picked him up 
and began to use him for political motives. You've got to be free of this repression. Society is repressing you. All of the categories are, in fact, invented. So you had uh, Foucault saying even madness, there's no such thing as madness. Madness is just powerful people uh, telling you that you are mad because you're threatening their power. Well, that's a lie. That's simply not true. There's such a thing as madness because there's such a thing as healthy human thriving, you know? And and so it was, uh, that part was a purposeful political attack on the cultural life of human beings and on basically on the image of man himself as created by God and God's image. And, you know, I'm, I'm not letting Freud off the hook. Again, it was embedded right. in his philosophy, but I just don't think he saw it. Well, they definitely understood something about the nature of man, as our founders did, too. And they took two very different paths, paths right? I mean, yeah. you mentioned uh, La roche Foucault. I mean, talk about a, a quote for our times, uh, him suggesting that people's hypocrisy, you know, the leftist hypocrisy you see all over the place, that should be just understood as the tribute that vice pays to virtue. You know, I mean, it's all of that sort of recasting, that moral relativism that is so emblematic of our you can't judge anybody uh, for anything except if they're a white, cisgendered conservative, right? I mean, that's where we're at. Now. Well, at least I, what he was saying—that's a—that's a different guy. I was talking about Michel Foucault. But that's oh, Foucault, Foucault. Foucault. I'm Foucault. sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, but 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 that but that phrase was saying at least hypocrites know that the values are there. You right. know? At least the guy who is who says you know you should never cheat on your wife, but he's having three affairs. At least he knows he should lie. Uh, the thing about the current left is they are now openly wicked and they are now openly forcing people, trying to force people to do the wicked things that they think are right. They always start. It always starts the same way, Dan. It's always, you know, this is a good pity, this poor unwed mother. You know, she needs an abortion. And then it always start, It ends with shout your abortion and celebrate killing babies. And, you know, I, I just think. Um, and don't I, be I the first they, one to stop clapping either. Yeah, yeah. And they, that's absolutely right. And I think we've reached that point, as you see in California, where they're threatening to take uh, children away from their parents if the parents don't affirm their gender transitions. It's not exactly what the law says, but it's what it's pointing toward. Right. And, and, and so eventually they have to use force. They want to cram this stuff down our throats. I actually think that this is the moment. I think the wheels are coming off this bus in a way because people are starting to rebel you know they don't like having their children taken away they they don't like being investigated as a terrorist when they show up at a pta meeting to protest what's being taught there uh they they know or, or, ke or kept in the, kept in the dark or kept in yeah. the dark purposely kept in there by law kept in the dark i mean right you have the california attorney general suing school districts that would inform parents about what's happening with their kid in school i mean these this is you know how far down the rabbit hole we are yeah, no, but that's that's right. And, you know, what you have to hope is that there's enough of the tradition of liberty in America for people to push back. And we do see this a little bit. You know, I'm, I, I, we see it in the election of Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, which was a, a great change. I mean, a really surprising change in that state's red blue status. Uh, we saw it in New Mexico the other day where the governor tried to take away people's Second Amendment rights. And even her own Democrat attorney general right. said, I'm not defending this. It's unconstitutional. So, you know, when when they are when they have the power to shove this down our throats, they do. And that's the moment when you have to hope Americans strike back. I I, I'm hoping, I know nobody wants to talk about the pandemic anymore and the lockdowns and the shutdowns, but I'm hoping that that taught people just how desperate, powerful people are to get more power. And, and you know, that you talk about the founders, yeah. that's all the founders ever talked about. How are we going to keep the power Restrained separate? Power. How are we gonna right. keep, yeah, that's all, the, that's all the Federalist Papers. It's like one page after another. You know, how, where do we put the power so there's other power confronting it and stopping it? And that's a conversation the left never has. You know, uh, there was this interesting observation by David Mamet. This is uh, April of last year when he was on Adam Carolla's podcast. And I just want to play it for you because one of the questions, and it was a good, good question that Carolla asked, and it was an even better formulation from Mamet. Um, but the question is, you know, what does the left fear? You know, let, let's uh, make sure we understand exactly what we're up against and what it is they don't want to see happen, what they fear. And that informs what they do, and it informs how you can predict what they're going to do. Let's play that uh, Corolla Mammoth clip. What do you think they're worried about? 
you know, when they're worried about Elon Musk. They're worried about exclusion. The anything, like I say, it's it's like living in a a sick household where daddy is 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 having sex with seven year old little Susie, right? The problem in that household is not that daddy is, is a pedophile and a rapist, but that nobody can mention the problem. That's the problem because if anyone mentions that problem, the family falls apart. You save little Susie, but the family falls apart. So everybody in that family is devoted to keeping the secret. So what we see from the left is everybody's devoted to keeping the secret. That's why what they fear most in the left, look, uh, it was Napoleon said, look at what your enemy tries to frighten you with. That's what he fears. Mm -hmm. So what the enemy is trying to frighten us, what the left is trying to frighten us with is exclusion. They think that's the worst thing in the world. Oops, if you say X, Y, Z, you're out. If you say Because they're terrified of exclusion because their only power comes from the group. A, I mean, a very well said. A, a, it was well said. A typically graphic metaphor from Mamet, but uh, nonetheless, the, that the left most fears exclusion, so they exclude first. You know, I actually think that, he, that Mamet uh, was saying two different things there that are both right. He, he, they use exclusion because what they really fear is exposure. And they use exclusion as a way of threatening you. And what he was talking about in that uh, graphic uh, example was exposure. Nobody wants to say that the evil is being done. In order to have free sex, you have to kill babies. In order to have free sex, you have to murder babies. So that's fine as long as nobody sees the babies getting murdered. So if anybody walks in to a, you know, if Project Veritas walks into a an abortion clinic and takes pictures or gets people to talk about how they're selling baby parts, you prosecute Project Veritas. You don't prosecute the people who are murdering babies. And so the thing I think the left fears most is actual exposure. That's why their conquest of our news media and our uh, entertainment media is so important to them because you simply do not see what they're doing and they keep you from seeing what they're doing. You see this, you know, to use a less uh, graphic example, you see this with Joe Biden where they said they're going to have an uh, impeachment inquiry and the press universally, all of them just said, well, there's no evidence. Right. No evidence, you know. Right. You might say there's no proof. That's what you have a trial to figure out is the evidence, does the evidence constitute proof? But there's nothing but evidence. There's 80 years of evidence. The guy's been venal his entire life and there's, they've got these reams of testimony uh, showing that he was part of his son's project, but they fear exposure, and that's why their dominance in the culture is so so important to them. That's why they hate Elon Musk taking over Twitter. I mean, Musk is Musk isn't said, oh, it's going to become a right wing site. He's just said, I'm going to let everybody speak. But you can't do that when you're doing bad things. And I think the 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 threat of exclusion the is is basically to beat us down that you're being cruel, you're being bigoted, you're being mean, so that we won't speak. That's the thing they hate most. You know, Tucker Carlson said something interesting the other day about Donald Trump. He said they don't hate what they do. They hate what he says. And I, I have always thought that there's a lot of truth to that. The problem with Donald Trump is he will not shut up. And that that can be a real problem for him as a political figure. And it may be a problem for all of us if he, if he can't, you know, win an election. But But in fact, it's the thing that everybody loves about him is that he just doesn't care if they call them names. And I think if we all behave like that, we could all speak a lot more clearly. And the thing they fear most is exposure. The thing they fear most is that you will actually see what their words and concepts and ideas mean and what they translate into in real life, because they translate into 800,000 babies killed a year. They translate into little children being sexually mutilated for an idea with no scientific basis. They translate into greater poverty. They translate into the beautiful city of San Francisco turning into a tar pit of hell. You know, that's what they actually translate. So don't look at those pictures. Don't show that on TV. Don't talk about that. And everything's going to be fine because the concept is great. You know, the concept, and, and, the idea is great. And, and so they have to go after people like Mamet, which they have done, interestingly. They're, I mean, you, you mentioned a Fox Butterfield moment er, uh, earlier in our conversation with feminists. There was a story in the Chicago Tribune uh, a few weeks ago, essentially what's happened to Chicago theater. You know, uh, their subscriptions are down, revenues down, ticket sales are down. Um, they're having to lay off people. And then uh, one of the anecdotes in the, uh, in the story that's describing all this is, uh, a theater director saying you'd have to be very courageous in Chicago today to uh, to put on a David Mamet play. So David Mamet is Chicagoan. He's the greatest living American playwright. 
And now, I mean, and I, a decade ago, I saw a play of his race at the Goodman Theater and, and many others. But but now today, it would be an act of courage to uh, to to agree that a Mammoth play would be presented at a, at a theater. So this is what they need to do. Mam Mamet, since his book, The Secret Knowledge, and since he's doing things like uh, Adam Carolla's podcast and saying the things you just heard him say, he's got to sort of be marginalized and tarred as some sort of right wing. Now he's a conservative commentator. Or he's a right wing or he's this and he's that because you're not allowed to take truth tellers seriously. You have to make sure that people are seeing somebody telling the truth as not telling the truth but as a partisan that you're otherwise ideologically opposed to. You know, absolutely right. And I, I tell you a funny story about Mamet. Mamet, it must be 20 years ago, he famously wrote this little piece in the Village Voice, a left-wing New York paper, that, that was headlined, I am no longer a brain-dead liberal. Right. And basically just saying right. he was kind of waking up. He was starting to wake up. And I wrote a piece about it in the LA Times saying, welcome to the, to the gang. And uh, that's how I met Andrew Breitbart, because Breitbart called me up and said, you're the only other conservative who knows who <laughs> David Mamet is. And, and, and Mamet told me, Mamet, I, so I, I, I met Mamet and I asked him after he wrote that piece in The Voice, did he get a reaction? And he said, yes, the New York Times showed up to my next play and panned it, not once, but twice. They actually showed up <laughs> the next night and panned it again. You know? so, and, and I think we should take that seriously, though. I think that shows you how desperate they are to keep people from speaking simple truths, that men and women were made for each other, that families matter, that freedom is better than slavery, that you know the, the, the climate isn't an existential crisis, whatever it is, they are desperate, desperate to silence it. When you look at what Joe Biden's administration tried to do, did actually, with uh, social media, that the judges now basically have said, if you go anywhere near social media, we'll, we'll throw you out, because they tried to censor any opposing voice. It, it is essential. You do not need to censor people when you're telling the truth. You need to censor people when they're telling the truth. I don't need to censor anybody. I'll argue with anybody. Seriously. I, I'll, I'll talk to Nazis. I don't care. I'll tell them why they're wrong. I, you know, it, it's like I will win that argument. I know I will win that argument because I'm right, you know, they're, and they're wrong. But I don't need to censor them because I'm speaking truly. I'm not lying about what I see. I'm telling them that they're taking the wrong path. And the left is lying. And they, the one thing the lies can't stand is being exposed. It's a nice segue uh, talking about Mamet, you being a man of letters, man of the arts. And one of the things you said in our conversations over the years uh, on my radio program in Chicago is conservatives, one of the things you've emphasized, conservatives failure to build their own castles in terms of producing culturally relevant quality content in all of the artistic forms that that can take. And, uh, I wonder, I mean, I know that some of that's happening at the Daily Wire now where you, you're at and you have that podcast. But I wonder, you know, a, a drum you've been beating for a long time. Do you, do you see us making progress? Because there's an example of us not making progress I want to get to, but I want to get your sort of foundational answer first. We're definitely making progress. I mean, when I started talking about this, it was more than 20 years ago. And I, I, I had been a liberal my whole life. And I came back. I left America for seven years, came back. And I thought, oh, my gosh, the culture has gone out of control. And I started to go to the only people who would listen to me on the subject, who were conservatives, and say, you've got to take care of the culture. And they looked at me. They thought I was cute because I came from Hollywood, you know, but they, they did not know what I was talking about. Now they all know. Now I get phone calls saying, what, how do we do this? How do we do that? Um, and and so and the Daily Wire is doing great work uh, moving the culture. It shouldn't be doing it alone. I'm, I'm worried about that. There's plenty to worry about, but, you know, that's OK. We're, we're taking positive steps. The, the big the next big hurdle for us to take care of is distribution. And it's a boring topic, so I won't go on and on about it, but we have to learn it's not enough to make films, it's not enough to write books, it's not enough uh, to create content. We have to own the things that spread and distribute the content. If, if YouTube is gonna shut us down, we need to have a, a competitive YouTube. If, if uh, the movies are gonna keep us out of the theaters, we need to have competitive theaters. That's why that recent film, um, uh, The Sound of Freedom, was right. so important because it overcame, it went completely around Hollywood's distribution system and created a new one. Some of the Christian films have done that too, but they haven't been very good. The Sound of Freedom was a good, solid thriller, and it made, I think, over $100 million. So it was a real breakthrough. So yes, there are breakthroughs. The ice is breaking. There's no question about it. It's just getting started. It's dangerous. It's fragile, but I'm hopeful. 
So uh, Sound of Freedom is uh, one example. Um, you know, you've had, you've had this Oliver Anthony uh, sort of a bluegrass country singer who's gone viral just by posting videos, right? Richmond, north of Richmond, uh, starting with that. You've got uh, Jason Aldean getting all kinds of hit for Don't Try That in a Small Town, comparing what's happening in urban centers to what's happening in sort of um, exurban rural America. Uh, you got the flap over uh, uh, Luke Combs covering Tracy Chapman's Fast Car song, which even Tracy Chapman supported, but he was still being called a racist. Tracy Chapman's like, thank you for, you know, half a million dollars in royalties in the first week. I'm glad that he's introducing my song into, you know, a new generation and a wider audience. That's, that's good news for me. So, you know, do those really represent, taken as a collective, because they've sort of occurred within a relatively short period of time of one another. Is that part of the break that you're seeing, or are we sort of grasping, like hoping that these sort of one-offs actually b are building into something? No, we, we are. We're hoping that these one-offs are building into something. But the, 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 the point is the over, moving the Overton window, moving what you can say yeah. in, in the arts and also reaching people. And, you know, the, the thing is, modern technology has given all of us a chance to reach one another and artists should be using that technology. I've listen, you know, you, you said before the show started that you met with a friend of mine in Chicago, he and I put together a, a, um, an internet story, ghost story that we, that could only be seen on iPads and iPhones and, uh, and on an app, you know, we did, I'll do anything. I will use any kind of technology to tell stories and to create art and to create beauty. And that's why I think that we should all only be encouraging. You know, I, I, we don't have to praise bad art, but we don't have to go out across the street to attack right wing artists. You know, it takes a lot of artists to create one great work. A lot of bad artists have to create bad things. We have to have that freedom. So the point, the things that you're talking about, all of them are things that make the truth speakable. When, when it, you know, I was, I was canceled in Hollywood for my opinions. I, I can't prove it, but I'm convinced of it. But I keep going. I keep publishing books. If you buy the books that I publish, which I, I will support, I think they're really good. You know, you put, you put people in a place where we can say the things that we say. Listen, I get pushback in-house from my editors about the things that I say. And I won't take out a word. I won't change a word if the story works and if the story is good. But not everybody is like that. Not everybody's willing to take the hits that I've taken. So we have to support everybody who speaks up and who dares to go up against cancel culture, which is a real thing, and censorship, and who dares to, you know, maybe make a little less money in order to tell a little more truth. And I think, uh, yeah, no, I, I think we, we're justified in being hopeful. You know, we can be worried. We can be anxious. We can say it's fragile. It might be stopped. It might go off the rails. But, you know, you can't uh, you can't succeed without risking no. failure. And, I and think you want to encourage more people. You want to encourage more people to produce. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Um, do you think you think uh, so? Um, two of your novels I mentioned at the outset, Don't Say a Word and, and True Crime, both optioned into movies. Clint Eastwood made True Crime. Right. Um, would those have been made uh, if they were novels Andrew Clavin wrote in the last five years with Andrew Clavin's profile? Would, well, the, the, would, know, would they have been crime, movies? I love Clint Eastwood. He is one of the great, great artists of, of American film. But True Crime, the novel, is about a white man in, on, put on death row because they need a white man to put, put him on death row and they convict him too quickly. They think he's guilty, but they're wrong. And he, he changed it in the movie to a black man. You know, he just and the, the writer just said, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't get away with it. And so even then. Uh, you know, they had to censor the kinds of things that I was doing. The, the whole and that was 30 novel, years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. The whole point of the novel, True Crime, is that the reporter who breaks the story is a terrible, terrible human being. And my point is, when you make a virtue out of lying, only a bad person will tell the truth. And that guy, if you go back and look at it, it, it predicts Donald Trump. It predicts Donald Trump. It's a guy with a loud mouth who can't be stopped, who does the wrong thing, but he tells the truth. And that's, you know, he's a very Trump-like character. And so even then they changed it. And ultimately with the wars on terror, when they were making films uh, showing our soldiers as the bad guys instead of the Islamic terrorists as the bad guys, that's when I started to speak up and my phone stopped ringing instantaneously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so so, yeah, no, that, that's a problem. But you know what? That's never going to change. We have to build our own systems. That's why I love The Daily Wire. That's why I love anybody. You know, because 
this is why I'm talking about distribution. It's not that hard to make a, a movie. You can make a movie with your credit card now. You can, you know, you can spend really little money and make a really good movie with the kind of technology that's available. You just can't get it out there as long as the left dominates and bottlenecks the the passages well, to that's, distribution. Well, that's a, that's a really good practical problem you're pointing out. It, like you say, it may not be sexy, but it's a real practical problem. Here's another one, and this this got me this week because uh, Variety did an interview of Ethan Hawke and his daughter Maya. And um, they have a biopic on Flannery O'Connor coming out called Wildcat. Uh, Flannery O'Connor was one of my favorite authors. Um, she was a devout Catholic. And this is one of the other things that may be not sexy, but is practical, is buying the rights to tell stories about seminal figures in human history, of which I would put Flannery O'Connor as one. Um, Listen to Maya Hawke describe Flannery O'Connor. Now remember, this is the early 20th century Savannah, Georgia. She's not a clear-cut hero by any stretch of the imagination. Um, she said, likely referring to Connor's having used the N-word in her written work. She benefited from a lot of the privilege of whiteness while being deprived of a lot of the privilege of maleness. Can you make a movie about someone without hero, hero worshiping them? Um, despite the faults, they're worth studying as a way of understanding the history of our country. So uh, a as unbelievably talented a writer as Flannery O'Connor was, as important a thinker as she was, and the, the context, the, what she wrote about, by the way, she was um, a proponent of integration. She was a supporter of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King. I mean, just some backstory here. People can look up Flannery O'Connor on their own, and I hope you do. Start with Mystery and Manners. But... But Ethan Hawke, these dilettantes in Hollywood, know nothing, Maya Hawke, who probably never had to read any Flannery O'Connor in preparation for the role, um, they, they're going to have the, probably the first and last word on Flannery O'Connor in terms of what people, you know, uh, writ large, understand about her. And that, that to me, I thought, as soon as I saw the story, I thought about what you said about building your own castle. How is it that conservative art houses, and number one, there's not enough of them apparently, but conservative art houses don't grab the rights to you know, a Flannery O'Connor story and they're first out of the box to make that film before somebody like Ethan Hawke and his Nepo baby make that film, right? I mean, that, well, right. Isn't, isn't that a functional problem too? Absolutely. But that's the place we're at. That's the, the starting point. This was true. I mean, it was this was more true 20 years ago than it is now, because now there are people who will do exactly what you just said. But and there weren't there weren't any then this woke. Uh, what does Elon Musk call the woke mind virus is a destructive and horrible thing. And the joke, of course, is that every single human being who supports abortion and who won't defend the lives of unborn babies is going to be canceled 20 years from now when people realize that it was demonic. You know, so, so like I'm, I'm kind of laughing in my sleeve that they're canceling people now, but they're they're going to. The, the future market yeah. singers. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, but but still, you know, what you're seeing, th this is the thing that I was complaining about more than 20 years ago. It, it's still in place, but it, it's changing. And I think that, that you have to be hopeful, but the fact that it's still going on is not a surprise, right? I mean, this is what we allowed to have happen. And as I've said repeatedly, it's because the right doesn't really understand the arts as well as the left does. I mean, maybe it's a lifetime of lying has made them good storytellers, but but the right can be, can tell great stories. I mean, Cormac McCarthy was no liberal. I, I, I'm pretty sure yeah. of that. And he's John a Millius. wonderful story. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. You know, we can do it. We're blacklisted. We're silenced. We're canceled. But we can do it. But the point of telling stories is not to lecture people on values. It's simply to represent a vision of the world that is true. There are different visions of the world and some of them are contain truth. And, and I think that um, conservatives have to understand that that involves talking about sin. It involves talking about sex. It involves talking about the joys of sin and the joys of sex. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a, a, a trilogy, a fantasy trilogy called Another Kingdom, which was very popular. The Daily Wire made it into a podcast. Podcast, yeah. And, and yeah, and it came out as a novel, too. And it, at one point, it has a Hollywood producer uh, sleeping with women by promising them parts, abusing women, essentially doing it was before Me Too, but it, they're Me Tooing it. And and the point of the scene was that it was bliss to abuse these women. It was bliss to get these young girls to sleep with them. It was fun. It was wonderful. And it was evil. 
And and a lot of conservatives were like, this is pornographic. And I thought, no, it's not. It's the opposite of pornographic. It's showing you that people commit sins for a reason. They commit, you know, they don't commit sins because they're painful. They commit them because they're thrilling, you know. And so we have to understand that conservative art doesn't look like conservative life. You know, I'm a faithfully married man for uh, an adoring married man for 43 years. Uh, I, I'm not living that life, but I know it's part of life. I worked in Hollywood. I know, knew what was going on at the time. And you have to let us do what we do, which is create art. And conservatives have been very bad about that and very uptight about it, even while they're watching Game of Thrones with its wonderful storytelling, but it's exploitative, truly exploitative sex scenes. So they, they let the left do those things. They give the left a free pass. But if I even have a more if I have a moral version of that, uh, they get upset. And that's that is a real problem. But again, it's breaking. It's it really is. The ice is breaking. And uh, and I'm I'm hopeful about it. But what you're what you're pointing out, which is also true, is that it's only beginning. The, the only the first buds of spring are, are coming up and it can always stop. But I, I don't think it is going to stop. I think this is a movement. Just the first couple flowers bloom, but there are thousands more. Um, I, right. I, I opened the show saying um, I wanted to get Andrew Clavin's definition or treatise on what is living a good life, since you've thought a lot about it and put so much, uh, of, so many of your thoughts down in writing. So let's close with that. What, what, what is living the good? You sort of were getting to it talking about your own life, but what, what is living the good life in, in your mind? Uh, living the good life um, in advance of not only your own self-actualization, but your role as a citizen and, and a, a, you know, and a free and a, you know, and a, and a free person. Well, you know, we started out talking about th this idea that sexuality is the most important thing about a person. And I just don't believe that is true. I think we are made in the image of God and the image of God is the most important thing about a person because you are in a unique version of the image of God. And here is, I will tell you something that every single person knows. And the minute I say it, you will know it's true. And even if you hate me, and even if you disagree with me, and even if you're on the left, you will know it's true. Not one of us is the person we are meant to be. Not one of us is the person that we were born and are supposed to be. We all know it. Each and every one of us knows it. You tell the m most famous, most successful movie star, baseball player, whatever it is in history, that uh, read this book, it'll change your life. He'll read this book because he knows he's got to change his life. Every single one of us knows that we are flawed and broken. And so if you start to live into that image, uh, in into that image, even just turning the ship in the direction of its North Star, turning the ship of your soul in the direction of the North Star, which is the image of God, you will start to experience joy. And how do you do that? Well, you do it through love. That's what, you know, the things that you love are the things that will give you joy. And the more worthy the things that you love, the more joyful you will be. So I love football. It gives me a little joy. You know, I love my <laughs> wife. It gives me a lot of joy. I love God. It gives me all the joy. It has made me my life an incredible, joyful, incredibly joyful life. Even in grief, even in times of trouble, I still feel the joy of being alive because I love uh, God. And so as you start to do that, you start to understand that, that it, it entails discipline and it entails certain actions that have been, you know, kind, kind of the, the road is kind of well-worn. It's narrow, but it's well-worn. So it's not like people get married because uh, that's what we do. It's We've kind of thought that through and that is the best way to express the, the erotic love because erotic love produces family and family is the most joyful thing, uh, you know, material thing you can have. And so you start to do these things in order to express that love. And as you move from small love to greater love to even the greatest love, uh, your life becomes more joyful. And when you even, you know, we're, none of us is there, none of us is at the final destination, but even as you start to move in that direction, even as you start to let go of the things that are holding you back, the porn and the pot smoking and the sleeping around and the stuff that's destroying you, even though it's so much fun and so much bliss, once you start to let go of that stuff and start to move in that direction, you will become a person who is worthy to be in the political sphere. You'll stop hating people. You'll stop thinking, oh, I've got to destroy this guy. And you'll just start thinking, I have to build something that looks like this beautiful life that I've been given. And and those, those are the people I turn to all the time. You know, I, I do not like the angry conservative. I understand how popular they are. I understand how on, you know, on people they disagree with. But, um, but no, that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is the guy who says, this is what it should look like. The, you know, this is what I, I'm trying to build. I'm trying to build a world in which male, female families are 
elevated and privileged, not a world in which other people are excluded or hurt. I don't, I don't, I'm, that's, I don't need that in my life. I don't need to hate anybody. Uh, but I do want to value the things that are conducive to real love. That sign that people put outside their house saying love is love is the stupidest sign I've ever seen. Love is a very <laughs> specific thing. Love, love is acknowledging the reality of other people and including them in your ego. That is what love is. It is I, I understand that you are Dan and you have a totally different experience of life, but if you get hurt, I get hurt. Now, you can't do that with everybody. You can't do that with mankind. But you could do it with your wife. You could do it with your kid. You do it almost automatically with your kid. And so that's the place to begin and to work from, I think. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what that, that's what I think it is. It's understanding what a human being is. He's not a he's not a, a sexual, a purely sexual being. He's a purely spiritual being with a body and a sex life. And I think that that's a much more important, joyful and productive way to live. Well thought out, uh, as anticipated. Uh, he is Andrew Claven. Follow him, get his podcast uh, over at Daily Wire, and pick up his new book, his latest, The House of Love and Death, the next Cameron Winters mystery novel, The House of Love and Death. You can pre-order that now. Andrew Claven, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for your time and insights. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's always great talking to you, Dan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. Please subscribe to this channel and like this video if you haven't already, it really helps us.